Travellers and welcome back to our arts and literary podcast and video show. I'm Megan Thomas and today I'm chatting with Claire McGowan, author of the recently published The Push, The Other Wife, the Paula Maguire series and many more psychological thrillers. She also writes women's fiction novels as Eva Woods with novels such as The Man I Can't Forget, The X Factor, How to Be Happy and more. Throw in the plays, articles, short stories, and you suddenly realize that if someone told you that five people were doing all this, you'd probably believe them. <laughs> Hi, Claire, how are you doing? Hi. Yes, I'm good, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us on Babel today. Um, how have you been over kind of this bizarre year? How's the writing been going and what have you been up to? It's been okay, actually. I think a lot of writers I know said they were having trouble being productive, but I had quite a lot of deadlines so I just kind of kept going as much as I could but feeling a bit burnt out nowadays so I'd quite like to take the rest of the year off if I could but I'm gonna have to do at least another week I think of work yeah yeah and then just think of next week as the end of the year and then <laughs> yeah go on holiday so something I'm most fascinated fascinated about, oh, sorry about that, <laughs> um, is why you write um, your different genres of books under different names. Um, how did that all come about? Um, yeah, most people always ask me that question, which kind of surprises me because it's very normal in the publishing world. It's quite a lot of authors have at least one different pseudonym, if not several. And the main reason is just to just for branding reasons. So if you write one particular type of book, people think that's what they're going to get. So if they got something completely different, they'd probably be a bit annoyed. So, so mostly for that, sometimes it's also so that people can be relaunched as, as if they are a debut, mm -hmm. um, which I don't, I don't know if that's something even readers even think about, but it's certainly something that they think about in publishing. So very, very common. I think most authors I know probably have at least one pseudonym knocking around. Oh, wow. And so how did you choose your Eva Woods, the name? Did you kind of have a list of all the names you wish you would have been called or anything like that? Um, so that was my great grandma's name and I came across it when I was doing a family tree when I was at primary school so I was maybe seven or so and I just thought it was a really nice name and quite unusual because everyone in my family has very Irish names and that isn't particularly one so it kind of stood out to me a little bit. Hmm. Hmm. Um, yeah so which one did you start with? Were you, did you start writing psychological thrillers or? Yeah I started as just writing as myself as Claire. Um, and then I had an idea for a sort of a rom-com so I couldn't do that as myself because it would be massively off-brand so I created the alter ego and did I think I think we've done five books so far as Eva Woods and, and one more to come out. Mm. Well yeah I was thinking about it earlier and I did think if you're kind of on either on either side of the spectrum if you're a crime fanatic or a um, um, kind of women's fiction fanatic and you accidentally bought the wrong one you would be a bit annoyed. Yeah exactly <laughs> you'd get like a horrible murder or else you'd get like a yeah. very sort of light-hearted love story you'd probably be quite disappointed either way. <laughs> and so your whole how did it all start all your writing um, did you which which was your first book and who did you publish with and how did you get that? Um, so my first book was The Fall which was published by Headline uh, not my actual first book. I had actually written another one before that, which took me about three years, at least three years. I really agonised over it. And then that hasn't been published as of yet. Maybe maybe it still will one day. Uh, and before that, I just spent most of my life writing bits and pieces and starting books and then never really finishing them. Um, but with The Fall, I was, I was quite lucky. I had I just finished it and that very day. A friend of mine sent me a link to a a creative writing competition and if you I think if you won it was, it was like a new I think it was only ran for that year as well and it was kind of fairly high profile so I just thought well I finished this book what, what have I got to lose I'll stick it in and I end up coming second so got quite a lot of attention from agents editors and suddenly got an agent from that and then quite quickly sold the book from that so that really really helped me go from sort of nothing to quite quickly being published. Yeah, well, so when you now you now got so many books published, um, are you ever writing mm -hmm. more than one at a time? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think um, because they tend to go back and forward a bit. So I'll write something, then it'll go away for edits, come back, more edits, copy edits, proofreading. So there's a bit of to and fro. So, yeah, absolutely. Always moving between projects. Um, I think I've worked on 
not writing the whole of the book, but I definitely have worked on like at least four books this year, I would say. Oh, wow. Yeah, if not five. So just, you know, bits and pieces here and there. So. Well, it seems um, with both um, genres that you write, they're often multi-perspective. So do you find, do you mm -hmm. have a really, um, a really diligent routine to make sure that you don't mix up characters or accidentally kind of have characters that are similar or anything like that? Um, I think it's always something that just comes to me quite organically, whether this will be a multiple viewpoint. So the one I've just finished, the next thriller, um, which obviously hasn't come out yet, I've just finished it. It's going to be just one viewpoint, but it is the same character. Is that a spoiler? I won't say anymore. That's a bit of a spoiler, but it is it is just one viewpoint. So that was very obviously very different from the push, which I think has nine points of view in it or something. So yeah. it just kind of depends on the type of story. I'll just kind of organically decide how many narrators this needs. Mm. Um, well, yeah, I've just um, finished reading the push and it was fantastic. Um, with especially, so was, um, sorry, what was that? I was just gonna say it was very complicated. So the next book is less complicated for me to write anyway with just the just the one narrator. So that was good. Yeah, but I, I did find um, you kind of, you drip fed information so um, well and strategically throughout it that you could very much keep their keep characters within your mind there were a lot of them but they were they were followable that's not a word but <laughs> pretend it is. yeah yeah and so I don't think I had yeah I don't think I had trouble keeping track of the characters but I did have a lot of trouble keeping track of the timeline um, mm -hmm. which is not something that I'm sort of naturally very good at so that that was a lot of kind of checking and rechecking and making lists of who was where because I'm trying to keep track of I think there's like 13 people at this party and then trying to keep track of where they all went moving around the house and things so that was quite tricky and when it comes to the more uh crime police elements of the book do you have to do a lot of research do you have a person who you're able to talk to about that kind of thing yes uh so very fortunate to have found a great police advisor uh, he's called graham bartlett um i believe he's retired now um so he will read uh, just like he just does this as a service which is really great really useful for authors so he will read my work and sometimes you sometimes I'll ask questions but sometimes you don't know that you've got things wrong so it's really helpful to get someone to read the whole thing if you can yeah absolutely mm -hmm. especially because it seems like the type of person that reads um these kinds of books are the kind of people that would be very affronted if you got a tiny detail wrong. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, and that's what we're up against. Not only do they know a lot about it, but also they're really, really sophisticated. So they're really good at guessing clues. So you have to just, yeah, any tiny little clue that you've given away, you have to think about it and think, well, should I take that out? Is that too obvious? Yeah. Well, we actually, we had an author on Babel recently who was saying she, started writing a book with a murderer in mind and then kind of halfway through realized actually that murderer didn't do it and had to go back and rework things. Um, yeah. Does that happen? <laughs> yeah, so I never plan my books, um, which people don't really, either don't believe me or are slightly horrified by. <laughs> um, I don't, I plan them kind of as I go along, but I don't know in advance what's gonna happen. Uh, I just wouldn't enjoy writing that way. So I don't think I knew who the killer was in the push for quite a while. Because it could have been anyone, that's the whole idea, is there's a whole group of people and it could have been any of them, so. Yeah, absolutely. I did, mm -hmm. I tried to guess, I wasn't very good at it. I don't know, I was like, it must be this person. And, and it, then by the next chapter, I was like, oh. Maybe. So there's usually quite a lot of things as well in the book. So some of them will be guessable. So people sometimes think, oh, I've guessed that, I've worked out what's going on. But they haven't, there's loads of other things going on as well. So sometimes it's like a bit of a red herring that you put in that's more easy to guess. Yeah, absolutely. Well. Your books um, across the spectrum deal with issues of racism, sexism, classism, general prejudice and meanness. Is this something that, the sort of social realism, something that you think is important to get into your books and have represented across your characters? To an extent, yes. Um, I think I'm just really interested in conflict and where it comes from. So I really like having groups of people thrown together who are very different and exploiting any kind of source of conflict between them. Do you, do you write a lot of your books, um, or, or are all of your books, um, set in London? No, so I grew up in Northern Ireland, so my Paul Maguire series is all set in Northern Ireland. Okay. Um, the yeah. one I've just finished is set in the Lake District, partly in the Lake District and partly in LA. 
I don't know why, that's just how it came out. Um, I mean, women's fiction, also far set in London, but the next one that's coming out next year is set in Belfast. Just, I've never read a, I don't think I've ever read a kind of women's fiction book that's set in Northern Ireland. So that was, that was quite interesting. That was my editor's idea, actually. Hmm. I really enjoyed setting it there. So yeah, it could be anywhere, really. Yeah. Well, so I'm interested to um, talk to you a little bit more about that, um, the genre of women's fiction, mm -hmm. um, which um, kind of, it, people talk about it a lot in, with varying degrees of kind of scorn and acceptance. Is it a, a genre title that you're um, comfortable with? Do you kind of, would you prefer if it was just fiction or do you think that this kind of identifying feature is fine so long as it's not used against the people writing or reading it? Um, I think there is value in classifying fiction as to what it's like just to help people discover it and choose what they want but it is a kind of frustrating name women's fiction because nobody ever knows what it means and I don't think anyone outside of publishing actually knows it either I've said this quite often to people I write crime and I write women's fiction and they know what crime is but they don't know what the other thing is at all and so I kind of find myself trying to explain it. it's like sort of like a rom-com but my later books aren't rom-coms they're quite sad some of them although they often have jokes in too but there's like they're often about very serious subjects too so I suppose it's like not literary, not book clubs. It is really hard to classify that whole area of fiction um, unless you can say it's crime or sort of sci-fi fantasy, horror or something like that, then you are slightly floundering around for what to call things. So sometimes maybe it's more helpful to compare it to other books or other authors. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the real, um, the place where I find it, um, offensive as a thing is when people kind of think it's synonymous with something like chiclet or um yeah or I mean being a bit meaningless or frivolous which is never really the case with women's fiction in fact they yeah, usually I think yeah I think there's a lot of stuff that got called chiclet that actually was very good as well it's just yeah. um it's the covers I have the most problem with actually it's the, the pastely covers mm. it's interesting recently there have been a few books come out that you could probably could probably would have been called chiclet back in the day or could be called women's fiction, but they've been published in a more mainstream way. So Queen, Queenie, for example, I don't know if you read that. Yeah. Um, in some ways, it did have one, it had lots of different covers, um, which was really beautiful. One of them was pink. Um, but it's like, it was sort of marketed slightly as a rom-com, but it, it isn't that at all. It's, it's much darker and sadder, I would say. Um, but I think that's been seen as a kind of mainstream fiction book. And as far as I know, it's been up for a few awards and things. So. Mm. Yeah, that kind of thing definitely matters. You don't want to get sight, but, but there is an absolutely huge romance market out there. I don't consider that I especially write romance, but there there is um absolutely huge market, loads of readers, loads of writers out there. Getting on with it. Yeah. It, it also seems like people that write um, women's fiction and crime and thrillers um, are often writing lots of books. They're kind of publishing one a year or one every other year. Yeah. Um, whereas, um, it seems like the bigger publishing houses perhaps only take on one of those kind of stories less often and maybe that's why it's so. Yeah, I think that's right. I think the, pe the people that write for Mills and Boone, for example, typically I think be four books a year. Oh, wow. And they are a bit shorter, but that's still like huge amounts of work. Yeah. So you have to get the type of writer that is quite um, workmanlike about it. And we'll sort of, so that, that's how I see myself. I'm always sort of juggling different projects and deadlines and. I quite like, I do have a lot of ideas, so I quite like writing quite a lot of different books. Um, yeah, well, I, that was also um, another question I was going to ask is kind of how do these ideas come to you? But it kind of sounds like with your process, it, they, they do, they just come to you and then you write them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've never known how to answer that. I just have always had ideas all, all my life since I was a young child, really. Um, conversely, it makes it very hard to get an idea. If I need to try and get an idea for something, I can't do it. I just have to kind of wait for it to come and it's often it's often like news stories or things people say I like gossip real gossip I really like listening to sort of stories about people friends of friends anecdotes and thinking is there a way to write about this this thing that seems like a universal experience hmm. um so my new my new thriller for example is about miscarriages of justice so that's just something I became interested in and read a lot about and realized there were huge amounts of them it's also slightly about it's inspired by a couple of sort of real life cases where young women have been accused of things murder and the way the media have treated them 
I mean, and I think that really, um, that really plays into people's fear of being accused of doing something they haven't done. Um, I know, it's terrifying. And there are huge numbers of people in America that are in prison, sometimes on death row for things that they haven't done. Well, I look forward to that one then. Um, mm -hmm. So when you're not two people at once, um, you're also Claire the teacher, the university lecturer, and every, you teach everything from how to get a book published to how to write it in the first place. Do you feel like you've got a recipe, something that you can teach um, in that way? How do you go about teaching creative writing? So I don't teach anymore at the university. Um, I did for quite a long time, for sort of five or six years. And I really enjoyed it. And then I, I got the chance to go and work overseas for a while. So I, I stopped it then. But it was really fantastic for a number of years and really rewarding. Um, I've come to believe, so I do still teach quite a lot of sort of one-off classes. Not so much this year, sadly, um, because they all got cancelled because of COVID. But I've done, I did an online one a couple of weeks ago, which was really, really enjoyable and really good. And I think I've come to believe that it's more important to teach people how to tap into their own creativity than to teach them techniques and absolutely you can teach techniques especially in, in crime writing there's loads of things around suspense and structuring and pacing that are really important to learn but quite often people know those already they just don't believe in themselves so they don't ever finish anything so I'm quite bizarre I could talk about this for hours I'm quite bizarrely fascinated by the way people put blocks in their own way so things like um finishing a book but then not not sending it to anyone or constantly starting books and then never finishing them or kind of telling yourself well, I can't possibly write this book until I quit my job so then doing that and then suddenly finding you've got all this time but you still can't write so just it's, it's really fascinating to me the way that people um get in their own way yeah and so, so would your kind of main piece of advice then be to get something down, send it to someone, let them tell you what to do next. Yeah, so I think the most helpful piece of advice I can give is probably not to use your delete button until you have a first draft. So I always tell people like, don't change anything. Like some people seem to think they have to get it really perfect before they move on. I don't think there's any point because once you, once you have a first draft, you probably will go back and change loads of things anyway. So I've, um, one of my recent books I had to take out an entire viewpoint character so the whole third of the book was just gone so there would have been no point in me getting that really perfect at that stage so I just see it more in drafts like start to finish rather than getting every little bit really good before you move on mm. it was also because I don't really plan anything uh, and the other tip I guess is I always tell people to write to have word count goals instead of time goals so people will sometimes say oh they write for four hours today that's a huge amount of time um probably if you said that you were going to do that you would just sit there for most of it and not necessarily do anything so I think it's better to just say I'll write a thousand words today or I'll write 500 words today and then just do it really consistently and the story kind of tends to take over I think and kind of take shape in a really enjoyable way so I'm, I'm always trying to get people to kind of let go a little bit I suppose rather than teach them rules yeah and that that word um that word goal seems like a much better way to then reward yourself if you do more than that because you seem like it's more likely that you'll do more than 500 words if you're having a really good day but if yeah because 500 words especially if you follow my don't delete anything method is really nothing you can do that in 10 minutes so mm -hmm. it really is especially if you don't think too much about it you really it really is just like how fast can you type sometimes so yeah so yeah it's, um, it's good to start I guess it's like running or something it's good to start really small and then you might find you can do more than you think maybe we should set up the couch to 5k of novel writing <laughs> that's such a good idea oh my god how would that work <laughs> five five thousand k maybe yeah so that's what 5k means that's what 5k means <laughs> um yeah no to five thousand words yeah. <laughs> maybe fifty thousand because that's what you do in nano nano rhyme you're supposed to do fifty thousand words in the month so yeah. yeah, I really like that. That's a really good idea. <laughs> Someone soothingly telling you in a podcast that you're you're doing great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> rest and stretch. You have to do you do have to rest and stretch a lot as well, actually. Yeah. I have a lot of other tips yeah. that are really practical, like back your work up and mm -hmm. get a proper chair. Don't use your trackpad on your laptop for too long because you will wreck yourself. So. Yeah, that's brilliant advice. Mm -hmm. I, I did find during this lockdown period that using my laptop as much as I do, I was kind of 
starting to it's see really it. bad for your wrists yeah um so I used to write sitting at the kitchen table for years and that was also really really bad for my back so I wish I'd known not to do that <laughs> need distractions in the kitchen as well <laughs> mm -hmm. um so um lastly um your books and the dialogue especially kind of really read like they're playing out in a film or a series in my head have you had any bites from um or options for any of your books uh yes i actually have my series is currently under option i think i'm allowed to say that um so that's been they've optioned all the books in the series all six that's in development uh obviously a lot of things get optioned and then don't go anywhere but, but that is currently happening and i also have a, a script that i wrote an original script that is also in development so that's kind of cool we're trying to move into that area a little bit as well yeah well, that's all very exciting. And yeah, I really recommend everyone at home, all our listeners go and get the push. Or I, depending on your preferred genre, I'll allow you to get one of either. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I really did. Um, I love the push and I also read The X Factor, which um, I really enjoyed. I actually listened to The X Factor um, as an audio book, <laughs> which was um, nice. Yeah to do it because the dialogue is so natural and the different characters so yeah thank you for writing them and uh, thank you for coming Thanks. to chat to me today um yeah. everyone at home yes um have a great day i'm glad um, you tuned in to listen to this session um we'll have buy the book links um and twitter handles and all the fun things you need to know on our website which is babbleshow.com and we'll see you next time bye bye